Hi everybody, welcome back to the Novitiate Book Club and today we're going to talk about Book 6 in Augustine's Confessions. So Book 6 really starts with Augustine still sort of pining for God, like why didn't I find you when I thought I was going to find you? And he starts with this little story about St Monica, where St Monica comes to join him in Milan and on the way the ship that she's in gets into danger and you know the crew sort of freak out and they think it's going to sink but St Monica has a vision and everything's okay. So that was just a story that Augustine starts off with. She, he basically says she rescued the, the crew. And he tells a few more things about St Monica in Milan. There was a tradition where she was from in Carthage where on Saints Day they brought like cakes and things like that to the shrines of saints sort of to offer them. But Ambrose wouldn't allow that and St Monica being very faithful to the bishop um, brought her an open heart full of prayers instead. So he really gives us a bit of an insight into his mother. And he also tells us a little an antidote that he had where he's talking to his mum and she's telling him about the crew and about the ship going to sink and he, he sort of, you know, because obviously he had visions about him before um, he she turns around to him and reassures him and says, you know, that I will see a faithful Catholic before I die because Augustine is sitting basically saying to her, well, I've been taken away from falsehood but I'm not quite in the truth yet and she's like, don't worry about it, um, you will be Catholic before I die and not only that, you'll be faithful. So that's a pretty good story um, that he remembers. Um, a few things then is Augustine has so many questions and he says he has so many questions but Ambrose was so busy that he didn't find the time to actually be able to approach Ambrose anytime he wanted to talk to him about specific things. He knew that it would take too much time and there wasn't enough time in the teacher's, in the bishop's time for that in the sense that he didn't go and ask him. I'm sure like any bishop if he had asked him he would have made time but Augustine was sort of thinking to himself, oh, he just doesn't have enough time or only short answers he would be able to give us. So he doesn't actually approach him to get the answers to all the many questions that he has. So he's basically got all these questions roaming around in his mind that he wants to ask and just hasn't got there yet to ask. And every Sunday he would go and he would listen to Ambrose preach and more and more he basically had Ambrose unveil the scriptures to him and he found that he actually became ashamed of what he thought Catholics believed that wasn't actually what Catholics believed. So by listening to Ambrose he really started to hear what was true about the scriptures, not what he'd been told by the Manichaeans. Um, he starts. He says he starts to understand that God has made a man, man's image and what that means and previously he says he actually had thought that Unlike us being made in God's image, he sort of took that to be God has made in our imperfect image. Um, that was a big learning curve for him to really see that God wasn't being limited to humanity and to the limitations that we have. And he started to see God in a slightly different way. But he does say in book six, I still don't quite get what um, in his image really means. He still sort of struggles with that a little bit when it comes to your likeness. Um, it's something that he's like he's not totally sure of, but he says he does believe that he was being converted. And he's on the road to conversion, and he's very glad about it. Um, as well as that, then Augustine starts to find that he really does love the scriptures, and more and more he's starting to learn the scriptures. But what he says is that he's still in that stage where I suppose a lot of people sometimes can be, where he knows that there's truth out there, but he's not quite willing to go that extra mile yet to actually accept it and he says that that's almost a scarier place to be because you're not moving forward and he says that could be quite fatal actually just to stay in that one place where you never make a decision you never have faith you just sort of wait like put it off to the next day um, Augustine being Augustine he's still talking about women at the stage and he's talking about how he's, he's pretty eager for marriage and he you know it's something that he thinks that he wants fame and he wants marriage and wealth as well and they're the things that he says are really still driving him his main um drives and uh, he says he's actually a bit preoccupied with it with the idea of well when will i get these three things and in book six he talks about how he's writing a speech for an emperor and he's trying to get he's trying to write it in such a way that He's thinking, well, how will the audience receive it? You know, he wants to do it in a way where he'll get the most applause. You know, he said he says pretty straightforward. It was all now looking at it. It was all to do with his own pride. He wanted the acclamation from the people, and he's really struggling with it. And he goes for this walk, or at least I think he goes for this walk, um, and he sees this beggar who's basically just drunk on the street. But it really strikes something in Augustine because he sort of thinks to himself, 
I'm not that happy. And he says, yes, okay, the beggar's drunk and it's not real happiness. But he says the beggar at least was giving out good omens, not even good omens, that's not even a nice word to say. Um, but he's basically saying nice things to the people that he passes on the street. Whereas Augustine, he's just looking for his own happiness. And Augustine really sees the difference in that. Although the beggar's drunk and it's not true happiness, he says that even in that state, the beggar's happier than he is because he's just consumed with looking for pride and his own, se his own selfish desires. He tells us then a bit about his, one of his friends, Alpheus. And he says that Alpheus basically, there's a falling out between Alpheus' father and Augustine, I think, and he wasn't allowed to be a student of his. But somehow Alpheus starts coming to his lectures and he stays just for a little bit of time. But when he comes, on one of the days when he comes, um, he hears Augustine talk about uh, giving a lecture on a passage and it really strikes a chord with Alpheus and Augustine just thinks to himself, I didn't even realise God, but you were using me for this person, for this friend. And it was about the it was about the arenas, you know, where they had all the animals for sports and the Coliseums and things like that. And his friend was basically into all that sort of thing. And Augustine's really trying from what he talks about, he says, you know, it's not that important, it's not it's not a be all and an end all. And he says it's not even something that, it's a fake sort of pleasure, but something that he says just triggers with his friend Alpheus and he decides there and then, it strikes a chord with him that he's not gonna to go to these games anymore. And he's really, he's really, um, he really stays solid in that for a long time. And Augustine is really, he really looks back and admires how he didn't know that what he said that day was strike a chord, but it did. And it gets him thinking, you know, for later in life, and he's looking back, he says, you know, God, you work in ways that we don't even know. You're working through us. I wasn't even a Christian, yet you worked through me. And another thing he then tells us about Alpheus is that he was a really good man. And he later, I think, became a priest, perhaps. He mentions some of his sacraments. Um, so he says he becomes a really good man. But Alpheus then tries to practice this self-control. And he does it for a very long time, and he overcomes all this stuff. But he says he did fall in then to a bit of superstition and to the, some of the beliefs of the Manichaeans as well. So he's really on the road sort of that Augustine was on. Um, but uh, Augustine says there's a big difference between the two of us. He was, had more self-control than I had. And he says it was for a long time he didn't go back to the games until he went to Rome. And when he went to Rome, his friends dragged him along. So he covered his eyes. But Augustine said he forgot to cover his ears. And when he heard the noise from the crowd when everything got... I guess a bit bloody and gross and gory. He opened his eyes to see what they were making the noises with and then became a bit obsessed again. So he learned that actually in that, he learned that it's not about himself, it's about putting his trust in God and asking for God's help in overcoming temptations and overcoming things that we shouldn't um, be doing. And he says that was something that he learned a lot, a lot later on. This is obvious he's talking about. He learned it a lot later on. He also says that God used another instance really to bring Alpheus to himself. And it was to do with a thief and a, match, or a machete, I think, or a hatchet or something like that. And basically, the thief gets caught, or sorry, the thief strikes an alarm bell. Alpheus gets caught in the place of this thief. And people are automatically straight away think that it's him. And everybody, the whole crowd believes it's him. And it's only later that day whenever there's an architect who suddenly starts to put two and two together and ask a few questions, they realise that he's not the real thief. And for Alpheus that's a big thing because he saw how the crowd was so warped up and so passionate about you're the criminal, you're the person who's punished, that people can go along and fall for things that aren't true just based on evidence that perhaps doesn't all add up. And for Alpheus, that was something that was a bit of a turning point. And by this stage then, Alpheus is in Milan and he becomes becomes an assessor um, and he's staying pretty much pretty close by Augustine. So the two of them and then another friend that he talks about in this book, the three of them sort of live together and search the truth together. So the second friend then that Augustine talks about in book six, and it's lovely that he gives us such, I guess such antidotes about his friends because you get to see a real insight into who Augustine was and the journey that each of himself and his two friends go on and they all discover God but how it all happens slightly differently and how God works through each one of them to bring each other to him if that makes sense. So one of his friends Nebridius then he actually came to Milan Augustine says 
for the purpose of being with Augustine. So the three of them are all living together. And he says, we're there to search for wisdom and truth. And you know, when you think of people in their early 30s, that's pretty good that three men want to live together to search for um, wisdom and truth. But Augustine basically says, I'm 39, I'm still philandering, so we still got the, oh, I don't know what I'm doing with my life thing going on. But, you know, he's still saying, you know, tomorrow I'll discover the truth, tomorrow I'll discover the truth, when is tomorrow going to be? Um, so he tells us a few things then about um, his friends and sort of what their life was like. And he says, you know, Alpheus was very self-controlled when it came to women. Um, whereas he says, Augustine, he says himself, you know, he was trying to point out to Alpheus all these great men who were married and still searched for wisdom and truth. Because um, Alpheus, he said, Augustine says, was trying to prevent them from getting married because, you know, if you're married, you know, how are we going to search for wisdom and truth together? So Alpheus is sort of thinking of himself and Augustine's like, well, here's all these great men that were able to do it. And then he realises, you know what, lust really attracts me and I sort of have, he calls it a disease of it. So he's like, yeah, I'm not like those men. So perhaps it would take me away from my search for wisdom and truth. Um, but he is, he says, incessantly being told you should be getting married so he actually does go ahead and make plans he proposes to a girl who he has to wait two years until she'd be old enough to get married he makes a whole deal with her family and everything and then he says oh yeah but my mistress had to go so the mistress goes leaves him with his son and he has to wait but then he realizes he doesn't want to wait two years so he takes on another mistress so we can see that Augustine's really still a bit all over the show. Um, he wants the truth and he's been drawn to the scriptures, he's been drawn to Christianity, but then he's still sort of living quite a worldly life in that he doesn't know, he, he, he separated the two of them at this stage still very much. Um, and he says, he ends the book with basically, that book basically saying, you know, that he's caught up in a lot of misery. He's got a lot of misery, so he's still searching.